think that people want to be associated with success. And what Johnson Controls has represented is a very long string of successes. We have today just world-class organization. That, that comes about because of the people and the commitment that we have from around the world. It's a great company. It always has been. Everybody does business the right way. We have a high degree of integrity. What else would you want in a company? We got three world-class businesses. They're global in scope. A uh, huge opportunity for us to continue winning in the marketplace. This success is it's not an accident. It's a consequence of what many human beings, over 130,000 human beings that work in Johnson Controls, have been able to accomplish. To have impact, to be able to come someplace and make a difference, and know that you've been here, that's the kind of company Johnson Controls is. Well, how many of us get the privilege of working for a company that's been around for 125 years? incredible achievement. When you look back at 125 years, you just think, somebody's done something awful right to go that long in the world we're in today. There aren't a lot of companies that can celebrate those years with the kind of financial success, the level of uh, shareholder value that it continues to be demonstrated in good times and in bad. There's a lot of pride but when you think about the, what's been accomplished over the 125 years. I'd like people to reflect on what got us here, you know, what made Johns Control successful. The world was an exciting place 125 years ago. New technologies and inventions abounded. The electric light, power generation, the telephone were all changing the way people lived and worked. Yet the places where people lived and worked hadn't changed much. They were limited in size and comfort because automatic temperature control did not yet exist. Warren Johnson changed all that in 1883 when he invented the electric thermostat. Well, it had never been done before. Prior to the invention of the thermostat, uh, an individual person either had to make the rounds through a large building to find out that an area was too cold or too hot for comfort. And then he would have to manually adjust a valve to change that. The thermostat does this automatically. Warren Johnson's invention launched an industry and changed the world's quality of life. With his idea and $150,000 in financing, he founded the Johnson Electric Service Company in 1885. Johnson's benefactor, William Plankinton, provided the capital, while Warren brought more innovations to life, including the first automatic zone temperature control system, making it not only possible, but practical to regulate temperature room by room, no matter how many rooms or how tall the building. That breakthrough not only enhanced comfort, but reduced fuel consumption a truly green technology. That was a game changer for builders, owners, and occupants. Johnson's control systems brought comfort and efficiency to buildings around the world, from the capital in Washington, D.C., to royal palaces in Spain and Japan, as well as schools, hospitals, stores, and offices just about everywhere. Johnson controls indeed changed the world's skylines. This modern skyscraper was not possible without several things happening at the same time. One of these was the steel frame construction. There's only so tall you can go unless you have vertical transportation. The last thing that really fits into place that's needed is how do you control the environment? And here's where Warren Johnson steps in and says, I have the system to do that. And the 90th floor or the 10th floor or the first floor can be just as comfortable as any of the others. And with that, the sky was the limit for the building industry. Warren Johnson was also fascinated with another burgeoning industry, automobile manufacturing. But his custom-built cars and trucks couldn't compete with Henry Ford's mass-produced models. Warren Johnson died in 1911, but his legacy would live on. Johnson's successor, Harry Ellis, refocused the company on temperature controls and sold all other businesses, including automobile manufacturing. A wise move as the building industry was booming. The company's controls were in demand everywhere. So were the company's people, who were deployed to service the systems and support customers. 
That focus on the customer continues to this day. 1914. The world was at war. The company faced a major challenge. The temperature control was still a luxury at that time. The uh, temperature industry was classified as non-essential to the war effort. So that was when they started to retrofit buildings uh, for the first time. Retrofitting old buildings with new controls generated much needed revenue while giving old buildings new life and greater efficiency. When the war ended, good times returned for the Johnson Service Company. The skyscraper boom continued. People flocked to movie houses, which needed air conditioning controls that we provided. In 1924, the company brought another innovation to market, the dual thermostat, which automatically lowered room temperature at night when rooms were unoccupied. That saved energy and money, which was especially important to school systems with limited financial resources. And this was uh, something that allowed building owners to obviously save, save fuel and save money. So that was very, very popular. And it was very timely in terms of the uh, invention because, of course, five years later, the um, stock market crashed and the Great Depression uh, ushered in uh, very much a um, need for devices that saved fuel and saved energy. When the stock market crashed in 1929 and the Great Depression hit, the company survived by helping building owners save what money they had by reducing costs in their existing buildings. Joseph Cutler took over from Harry Ellis and guided the company past the Depression. The business thrived by bringing advanced zone controls to schools, hospitals, department stores, theaters, and convention centers. But once again, the world was at war. Only this time, Johnson fared better. The government then saw building controls as essential to the war effort. The company equipped military training facilities and defense plants with building controls, which saved fuel that was needed out at the combat zones. World War II ended. Peace returned. A symbol of that peace, the new United Nations building, operated with over 3,600 Johnson thermostats and controls. With peace came prosperity and another building boom with increased demand for air conditioning and temperature controls. Our controls weren't just a commercial success, they even helped save lives. In 1955, Jonas Salk developed the first safe polio vaccine. The company producing the vaccine had Johnson control systems installed in their virus incubating rooms. In 1960, we celebrated our 75th anniversary. With a new decade came new leadership and new opportunities. Richard Murphy presided over the company's expansion with subsidiary operations in Europe. Our presence grew, as did our sales, to over $100 million by the mid-1960s. Meanwhile, the space age was upon us, and Johnson was very much a part of it, serving NASA facilities that worked on the Apollo program. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. As impressive as landing a man on the moon was, computer technology back in 1969 was primitive by today's standards. We were still living in a largely analog world. Fred Brengel became CEO in 1967 and led the company into the digital age with the introduction in the 70s of the first computerized building management system. These digital control systems worked so well, computer giant IBM had them installed in their highly sensitive computer rooms. And since the system was mini computer based, even small building owners could afford to automate their buildings to save energy and money. Saving energy became critical in the early 1970s as oil shortages drove energy costs sky high. That predicament led to a major change for the company. With the exception of the earliest years, Johnson Controls was a temperature control company and management after the energy crisis of the early 70s understood that we needed to diversify. We needed some other business to balance the uh, cyclicality of the temperature control field. So that was the, the acquisition of Globe Union. Globe Union's automotive battery business presented an opportunity for Johnson Controls to diversify and Globe's electronics business enabled them to gain more capabilities for this new digital age. However, making the electronics business competitive globally cost too much, so the company sold that part of Globe and kept their automotive battery business. A wise choice. Globe was the largest automotive battery manufacturer in the U.S. Beyond size, Globe added innovation and marketing savvy. Their breakthrough battery design reduced weight and increased storage capacity and they helped make the Sears Die Hard a household name. 
Johnson Controls soon became the preferred battery supplier to most auto manufacturers and to major retailers across the U.S., providing them with superior products and marketing support. In 1985, the company's centennial year, sales topped $1.7 billion. 20,000 employees staffed operations in 20 countries. Diversification and growth continued. By acquiring Hoover Universal, Johnson Controls became a leader in the automotive interiors business and the plastic container business. Good timing, as automakers started to outsource seating and soft drink companies made plastic their container of choice. But Johnson Controls couldn't support both enterprises, so they eventually sold the plastics business in order to develop and grow their automotive business. That worked. Johnson Controls became the largest automotive supplier in North America, serving every major car company. And with plants around the world, they quickly became an international player too. Automotive took off. It, uh, it was right there at the right time to be able to capture the, the trend towards complete seats and just-in-time manufacture. And, and the Japanese auto manufacturers brought that into the United States. Uh, we learned it from them, uh, and then we were able to take it to the world. Meanwhile, the battery business hit a snag. New purchasing management at Sears switched suppliers in 1994, and for the first time in 67 years, Johnson Controls was no longer supplying Sears with batteries. The company regrouped under CEO Jim Keyes and turned this major setback into a major success by transforming how the battery business operated. So we really um, you know, implemented this process called best business practices where we were able to benchmark all of the key metrics in all of our operations and uh, over time we're able to standardize processes and standardize around metrics and helped us drive improvement really in, in, in every operation around the world. We kept driving uh, continuous improvement and you know our costs kept getting better, our quality kept getting better, we kept winning business. Thanks to these efforts, Johnson Controls Power Solutions business became the sole source of lead-acid batteries for almost every major U.S. retailer and eventually won Sears back. The company won many more customers beyond the U.S. by acquiring the brands Varda in Europe, LTH in Mexico, and Hilliar in South America, establishing a strong position in those markets. The company would continue to grow globally, and with good reason. That's where the customers were and not just in the battery business. Well, as we grew in the, our businesses, we realized that our customers were becoming more global. Uh, so if you started from the customer standpoint, they wanted the same service, the same expertise, the same technology worldwide that you gave them in, in North America. So it was a major transformation from being a domestic company to be an international company with well-founded international operations. The transformation continued with outstanding results. When I went on there, Johnson uh, Control Board, they were just under four billion dollars and when I left they were just over 30. Every way probably a company could have been successful uh, during that era, I think uh, Johnson Control managed to do it. The automotive business, known today as Automotive Experience, acquired companies in Germany, France and Italy that positioned them as a key supplier not just of seats, but automotive interiors for major car companies in those countries. They expanded into emerging markets in Eastern Europe and the Far East, establishing successful joint ventures in China well ahead of the competition. We had good product to offer, technologies in the systems of uh, just in time, uh, a good reputation coming from North America, coming from Europe at that time, and uh, extremely good relationship. In the midst of expanding their global reach, Automotive Experience broadened their innovative capabilities with the acquisition of Prince Automotive, long recognized by automakers for their leading-edge, value-added vehicle interior systems. As the automotive businesses evolved, so did the controls business. With the 1990 introduction of Metasys, building systems that were once controlled separately could now be integrated and automated for optimum efficiency. Metasys became the choice of building owners around the world and was even installed in such notable places as the Eiffel Tower. Johnson Controls became not just a controls company but a facilities management company with the acquisition of Pan Am World Services and Procord. During John Barth's tenure as CEO, the company set its sights on further growing the building efficiency business. 
And so we made a couple small acquisitions. We continued to globalize. And so then along came York, and it was just a tremendous fit for the company. With the 2005 acquisition of York International, the business, now known as Building Efficiency, became a true global enterprise. Not only did we get a much broader customer base, a much larger service base, uh, international opportunities, but it also added scale in other markets that we didn't have before. The acquisition and successful integration of York into the existing business resulted in building efficiency becoming the largest global service organization, with branches everywhere the customers were. Building efficiency continued to grow in size, global scope, and in the innovative capabilities they could offer to customers. They pioneered performance contracting, which guarantees energy savings for customers that often more than pay for their systems making it possible for schools and other entities with budget limitations to afford much needed renovations. And their Global Workplace Solutions Group now manages the entire life cycle of workplace properties for some of the world's most prestigious global corporations. A lot has happened in the last 125 years, a lot of growth and success, with three world-class industry-leading businesses, building efficiency, automotive experience, and power solutions and with outstanding stable leadership. Just nine CEOs in a century and a quarter. The company has continually generated solid earnings and has a remarkable track record of paying dividends every year since 1887. But it wasn't always easy. In 2008, the financial markets collapsed and the auto industry was in crisis. CEO Steve Roll and his management team took action early made the tough decisions that had to be made and positioned the company to survive the crisis. Johnson Controls did more than survive. The company returned to profitability in 2009 in every business and every region around the world. It was a test, a huge test that just came quickly and really unprecedented in modern times. We weathered that storm and we're better for it. Johnson Controls is thriving today while building for the future with innovative products, services, and technologies that will excite our customers and benefit the world at large. For example, the RE3 concept car, which we introduced at the 2009 Detroit Auto Show, showed that the car of the future can be small, yet roomy, comfortable, safe, and sustainable. That's because our seats and interiors are strong and secure, but weigh less, and take up less space than conventional products. Plus, they're made with renewable materials. What's more, the RE3 is a plug-in hybrid designed to save fuel and reduce emissions, which points to another exciting opportunity, and that is to address a vital need facing the world today, a cleaner, greener environment. That's something all our businesses do every day. Through a joint venture with SAFT, we're pioneering the production of lithium-ion batteries for the next generation of hybrid and electric vehicles. This green technology is so important, the federal government provided a large grant enabling Johnson Controls to build the first lithium-ion production facility in the United States. Meanwhile, since buildings account for 40% of the world's energy consumption, we're making them more efficient. And while today there's tremendous trends around the focus on climate change, energy efficiency, the need to manage and operate buildings effectively, it's what we've done forever. Johnson Control you know, was relevant 125 years ago, but is more relevant to the world today. Because the challenge for the 21st century is going to be, how do we provide a great quality of life for nine billion people? We can actually reduce pollution dramatically. Uh, we can uh, deliver clean energy for people at scale. We can only do that if a company like Johnson Control is at the center of actually making all that possible. But the name of the game is really going to be retrofits because we have so much of a building stock, whether it's residential or commercial. And so I think what you're doing in sort of entire spaces um, is really going to be an important part of the solution. A big part of what we're doing is working with the Clinton Climate Change Initiative to retrofit buildings all over the world, including the iconic Empire State Building, which we are making 38% more energy efficient. Our savings are calculated 4.4 million dollars a year. Our payback is in three years. But once we've made that payback, it's not over. Those savings flow to our bottom line year after year. The Empire State Building, 
is going to be reducing its energy costs, therefore its costs of occupancy, and at the same time helping to fulfill its corporate mandate to reduce carbon footprint, to reduce energy consumption, to be in fact more sustainable and less impactful on the Earth's environment. What we do for our customers, we've done at our own facilities, including our headquarters campus. It was everything that we stood for. Taking the latest green technologies, geothermal, solar, those types of technologies, integrating them and making sure that we had a, you know, a smart campus. No wonder Johnson Controls is consistently recognized as a great environmental steward. We're also recognized as a leader in supporting diversity in our workforce and supplier base. Our employees uh, are made up of different ethnic groups, different geographies, et cetera, from around the world. We're able to create jobs, and all those things add to the sustainability of not only our business, but also to the respective communities where we do business in. Johnson Controls has distinguished itself from other corporations because they have top to bottom uh, involvement. Everyone in the corporation is part of the success of a strong supplier diversity program. And their employees should be very proud that Johnson Controls has won our highest honor. Perhaps the highest honor we continue to receive is the level of success we've enjoyed these last 125 years. There are many reasons for it, including an unrelenting commitment to the customer, something that started with the founder, Warren Johnson. He deployed his sales force in every principal city where the company did business to get closer to customers to find out what they needed and meet those needs. Something that continues to this day in all our businesses. We have a customer-focused organization, so everything we do is built up around customers. We listen well to our customers' needs. That's probably the primary thing that we do, and I think we've demonstrated the ability to deliver what the customer asked for. We have customers in our building business that we've had since the buildings were first put up. Um, and so as the buildings go through their life, we're there with our customers. You look at their automotive customers, it's the same thing. And in battery, it's the same thing. These customers are really customers for life. And I think that's what's important. And that, th that relationship is transferred from person to person and inside the company. And I think that's what makes us different. What also makes us different and highly successful is our set of values. The values define behavior behavior defines culture, culture defines what you do, what you do defines whether or not you are serving the customer, and whether or not you serve the customer is whether you survive. First of all, you are a model of integrity. That has to be the number one thing. You do the right things as the company, and it's not just words, it's backed up by process, it's backed up by actions. We don't compromise on our values, but we also don't rest on them. We constantly look to see how we can be better in the future and set goals to get there. We call that our 10-year marker. It was instituted by John Barth when he was CEO and continues to evolve under current CEO Steve Roll. A primary reason Johnson Controls has endured and prospered for 125 years is that we've developed a unique culture through which our employees thrive and our customers and shareholders benefit. It's certainly a culture of growth and success. It's certainly a culture that drives ownership for the business deep down into the organization. The culture is one of winning. People come to their job in the morning trying to figure out how to make Johnson Control successful. I like to think that it's, um, you know, say what you mean and do what you say. You have, I think, a culture which goes back to integrity, respect for our customers, and respect for our shareholders. You can't beat that. We are recognized around the world as a great place to work. It's really the culture that exists. A unique culture, strong values, a legacy of innovation, and making a difference. That's who we are after 125 years. It's a remarkable history. Some companies talk about wanting to change the world. For 125 years, we've actually done it. Everyone here now and everyone who's ever been a part of Johnson Controls should be proud of what they've done to create our legacy and build the bright future that lies ahead. When someone comes up to you and says, where did you work? And you're able to say, I worked at Johnson Controls. 
and you get a reaction that says, wow. To me, that's quite a statement. So for 125 years, and for all the retirees that we have that, that have worked for the company, I want them to be very proud of where they work. And just think about the things that we're doing that are good for our, for our customers, good for the environment, um, good for our industry. Uh, I think that we have so much to be proud of. 125 years isn't achieved by very many companies, but you should be proud of your part in it because every person has played a part in producing this result. It's about all the employees that have ever worked for Johns Controls and what they've contributed. So for the employees who are listening to this, I guess what I would suggest, what I would recommend, is to help us write those future chapters. I mean, this is an opportunity to really be a part of history, to be part of a, a long heritage of a company with a proud history and a proud future. And I would just simply challenge them to come to work with their new ideas and a new engagement to help us be successful in the future.